really box out of science or scientific recognition. Perhaps the very fact that you don't know her story is a sad reminder of the flaws in our scientific history. But the world has shifted and continues to move into a new age of medicine, technology, and understanding. I believe that every person in the world deserves to not only have an education, to be exposed to the full measure of science, art, and history, but I think our era will allow anyone interested to make active contributions to those realms. This is especially important to science, where the specificity of the subject and complexity of individual phenomena may deter those without a college education from exploring the grand vistas of scientific knowledge. So, long story short, you get bored when you come to college and you start studying science, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? So what is citizen science? Citizen science is simply scientific research by amateur or non-scientists. That's me, because I'm a freshman. I haven't even taken a chemistry course yet, which means that maybe I'm going to be one of that 40% who ends up switching because it's tough. Um, it's public participation in our quest for truth about the natural world. Whenever you hear the phrase, leave that one to the scientists, or something along those lines, that's just a cop-out, because non-scientists can participate more than ever before. In essence, we all can use the great powers of analysis inherent to our minds for a project that traditionally seems out of bounds, especially if you do not have a degree in that field. However, such boundaries have not stopped people in the past. In fact, um, today we're going to talk about some people who aren't scientists who have actually published uh, research papers in uh, peer-reviewed journals, which, by the way, hasn't happened since Benjamin Franklin's time. So that means you or you or you can participate in one of these games. Some of them are video games. Some of them are just you know, open access projects. And you can have your name on a research paper that uh, scientists reference for years to come. So, um, you can make your mark uh, in the scientific community even if you're studying Shakespeare. You can explore the galaxies for the traces of an unknown exoplanet, or look for cancerous marks on a cell, and perhaps even more relevant, you can work with projects dealing with the ecology of specific areas, perhaps your own. Citizen science has been around for a while. Um, there have always been volunteers, amateurs that contribute data to projects like um, if you've ever dug at an archaeological site or at a, I guess, pretend one, a museum, um, where they bury uh, the, the bones, uh, then you know that not all of them are paleontologists. Some of them are grad students, some of them are postdocs, but some of them are just kind of along for the ride because they like discovering new things. It's exciting. It's fun. That's what science is. In fact, I think that's what art is, too. When you create something new, it's a process of discovery. So, one of these projects that's been going on since 1987, and this one's not the most, uh, uh, this won't blow your mind, but it's the, one of the older ones that I've found. It's called Feeder Watch. So, every year 15,000 people <laughs> count birds at their feeders in their backyard. So, they contribute valuable data. Uh, 1.5 million check checklists have been submitted since 1987. Feeder, feeder watchers, I guess is what they call themselves, have contributed valuable data enabling scientists to monitor changes in the distribution and abundance of birds. Using feeder watch data, scientists have studied the influence of non-native species on native bird communities, examined the association between birds and habitats, and tracked unpredictable movements in winter bird populations. This is super relevant because when you live in an age where biodiversity is decreasing at an alarming rate, bees, bats, all sorts of things are on the path to extinction, which means corn and all sorts of other plants are need to be pollinated and it's going to get tougher to do that without a, a natural wild bee population. This kind of data is super valuable and all you have to do is take a couple minutes out of your day to you know, go count a bird at your bird feeder and identify it or something along those lines. Um, participants gain from the rewarding experience of watching birds at their feeders and contributing their own observations to reveal larger patterns in bird populations across the continent. So, some of you may question, why would I ever want to do that? Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't want to feed birds and, uh, I don't know, count them and stuff. I personally don't want to do that, but some people really like bird watching, each to their own. Um, why would you want to participate in the scientific process? Honestly, because it is fun. 
it's useful. And it's, it gives a, a sense of meaning and purpose to your life that um, you can find in other things, but I think uh, a lot of people neglect science for what it can do in that regard. It helps you become a lifelong learner, which is something they're definitely pushing here at UVU. They want you to continue to learn even after you graduate, even if even after you have a career, a nine-to-five job, and instead of coming home and plopping down on the couch and watching TV, maybe you can look for cancerous marks on a cell and help someone, right? The more informed you are about science, the better equipped you are to judge the arguments of politicians, pop culture trends, and sensational internet claims for what they actually are. Bogus. Most of them, bogus. And not what people say they are. There was a paper published recently, I mentioned earlier, by people sitting at home. They weren't at Berkeley or MIT or Cold Spring Harbor. They were just interested people who discovered something by using a unique tool that I'll describe a little bit more later on. These are uh, non-scientists. Can you imagine writing a peer-reviewed journal article just right now, having no credentials and having it be accepted? It's a, it's a really big deal. Um, even if you think that Emily Dickinson or David Foster Wallace are the only people with work you'd like to study, there might be a bit of Marie or Pierre Curie and you get. And actually, we're going to look at one of these projects that actually has to do with Shakespeare. So, let's see if I can find it right here. So this is a citizen science website run by Scientific American. It's got a bunch of projects listed. Um, you can see there's one native to Wisconsin where you're probably looking at uh, pictures people took, identifying the animals and letting them know what the populations are like. Um, this one, the Online Wisdom Lab, has you take uh, surveys and quizzes and I think games that basically, it's a psychology experiment. Um, there's a bunch. There's uh, some that have you look at uh, a bunch of galaxies and defining their shape, their size, and what kind of galaxy there are. And you, you learn little bits and pieces all along the way. And it's not, it, they make it with non-scientists in mind. They're not just going to dump graduate level course stuff on you because they want help, right? And you're not going to get a million people to help on a project if you're instantly shut off by the jargon that science sometimes has. So, in this one, so this is run by the Fulger Shakespeare Library, and it's on Zooniverse. If anyone wants to check out Zooniverse, that's got a lot of good stuff. Um, basically, what you're doing is you're going through old manuscripts from people in the 1500s and 1600s. And if you find a word that isn't in our current lexicon of the English language, they'll add it to the Merriam-Webster, or the Oxford English Dictionary. So you can discover a new word, maybe a beautiful word, that can be added to the dictionary. And you, know, you get to claim that. Um, it, the whole point of the project is to help get a cultural understanding of the time when Shakespeare lived. And since they have digitized all of these records, we can do that now. So instead of just guessing about um, what Shakespeare might have done, they'll have actual data to what he probably did. Um, see, that one's, that one's again, that one might be a little bit boring because you're transcribing letters, but if anyone's done family uh, search indexing, after the initial plateau of being bored, it can be really interesting and really fun. So here's a pretty intense community project that actually has the capability to save lives. So I don't know if anyone's ever lived near a volcano. I haven't. Uh, and you'll have to, I, I apologize because I don't speak Spanish and there's a lot of uh, uh, Spanish and Ecuadorian names here that I, I can't say. We can help you translate. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, so there's a farmer, right? in the mod modest surroundings of the Ecuadorian Andes village, uh, Bilbao. Um, and he plies the land, uh, plows the land by day and monitors volcanic eruptions by night. He's one of 35 residents across local villages and towns in the path of that volcano, which I can't say, Tumarahua or something, that make up the network of volunteers known as the Watchmen. That's the, I guess, the Spanish word that's translated something like Watchmen, Guard, or Centennial, or Sentinel. Um, they have passion and enthusiasm for they, that they bring to these local roles they have in monitoring this volcano. Um, 
I think uh, back when they first, uh, when it when it actually went off, uh, in the late 90s, I think, they were forced out of their homes and they, they were kind of blocked out of the area by military checkpoints. But these are their homes, they're proud of living next to a volcano, this is their heritage, and so they overrun the army checkpoints and live there anyway. So now what do you do? There's a volcano that could erupt at any given time, you know, you don't have a billion volcanologists, that's a pretty specific field to go and monitor this thing, and people could die. You know, it's a serious deal. So what do you do? You train the citizens themselves in volcanology, and you teach them the warning signs and, and uh, give them the, the latest data to, to protect them. And that's, that's exactly what they did here in Ecuador. Um, they work closely with the uh, IGEPN, which is the Ecuadorian Civil Protection Agency. Um, citizens are trained by scientists at the Institute about what to observe, how to describe phenomena, and how to communicate with the local civil protection organizations that manage the volcano. Every night at 8 p.m., you know, like a vigil almost, they report their observations to the civil defense on a joint radio system. And they also uh, assist with evacuation drills. So these people that, um, here we have a little volcano there, these people that, you know, were just kind of, they're farmers, they're, they're you know, uh, your average, uh, you know, citizen in this, you know, small mountain town, they've been trained to uh, recognize as well as a volcanologist can do the threats that a volcano poses and how to see that. And they've actually become leaders in their communities. Um, in evacuating, you know, for evacuation drills and all sorts of things. I can only see this as a positive, you know. In volcanology, there's a great deal of research that's put into the prediction of specific hazards. Um, typically, these watchmen will live in communities where there are between 15 to 300 people, and men have naturally gone on to become community leaders. Villagers, not just the leaders, the villagers now listen intently to the radio networks and often gather around in groups to hear updates and communications. So they're united as a community in a common goal to protect themselves, you know, from, from this beautiful and dangerous natural phenomenon. So, what's most noticeable and key to the network's continued existence and impact is the motivations of the citizens, the watchmen themselves. Why would, you, why would you want to do this? You know, why would you want to step up to the plate and do this? Many are interested in science. Um, and I think pretty much anyone, if you've ever seen Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan or Bill Nye as a kid, um, you have at least a casual interest in science, right? Um, maybe uh, these people are willing to learn and they, they contribute to helping people feel safer in their neighborhoods. Um, one of them started their own volcano museum after he uh, had a seismometer installed near his home. A local fire chief made the na radio network possible by getting radio mass around the community. Um, others have filled bookshelves with volcanology textbooks and are teaching their children on the science of volcanic eruptions, while uh, Watchmen radio communications have become as popular as sports matches in some of the communities. So not only are the children learning cutting-edge science, um, I think that that sets them up to be uh, premier in, in whatever they do in life, whether it's in science or not, because they're having this education, right? Um, anyway, so that's an example of citizen science that saves lives. I don't live near a volcano, so I don't have a drastic example like that, but um, I think in the future, when it comes to things like bees and global warming, that's easily if, uh, as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than living next to an active volcano. Um, so moving on, we're going to switch gears a little bit um, to uh, crowdsourcing. Has anyone heard of crowdsourcing? Raise hands. Business majors, maybe heard of it? No, not this. One. Okay, other people then. <laughs> um, Crowdsourcing um, has many ties to business, um, but it's pretty much uh, utilizing an online platform to get uh, thousands of people together to contribute ideas, um, sometimes to do work, uh, and it's, uh, 
it's a pretty powerful model for, for innovation. So this is crowdsourcing.org. None of these are science websites, by the way, but there's a growing number of science websites that use these same principles. All of these from Netflix to, um, I actually don't recognize a lot of these, the blog TV, whatever that is. Oh, all of these utilize um, this up and coming uh, innovative thing. And I actually went and I talked to Mark Seastrand at the Entrepreneurship Institute um, because he was the guy that knew the most about uh, crowdsourcing um, and specifically crowdfunding. And he's going to talk about that. For those of you who don't know, crowdfunding is just like an online donation system. The funding aspect comes along, it's, it's an important part of any business, where you get the funding, where you get the resources. The crowdsource funding and, and any aspect of the funding though is still a function of how good is your idea, how well have you defined your idea and put the pieces of the puzzle together to where it really tells a story or really has some substance to it that makes the idea viable and workable. A lot of businesses fail because they haven't really made it through that process. And so it comes down to whether you're, you're, you're using crowdsourcing or whether you're borrowing money from you know, the, the family, friends, and pools or whether you're going to a bank. You have to have a solid business plan. And what I love about crowdsourcing and, and the crowdfunding is that it not only has a potential to give you the, the funding that you need, it's a great validation tool. Because part of what you have to do is uh, start a new business is before you invest a lot of money in developing prototypes and, and, and developing your idea, you want to really make sure that somebody is going to be willing to pay for this product. That somebody's going to look at your idea and your concept and say, I like that. I'm willing to, uh, to invest. So it, it's not only, for me, that it's not only just the funding uh, aspect, but it's the validation that offers a lot of a lot of credibility, a lot of reassurance to you know the entrepreneur that hey, it, it, I've got some money you know coming in, but more importantly, people like my idea. So um, that's for business, but um, ever since about 2007, 2008, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, like uh, the Sci-Fun Challenge, have been an up-and-coming way to pay for scientific endeavors. Because government grants, your tax money, can't pay for everything you want to do in science. Um, especially with uh, really expensive technologies, it's just not possible. Especially with budgets, um, uh, even with uh, modern initiatives, budgets are slashed. You know, every year NASA's gotten into hot water trying to pay for stuff. They have to justify themselves for, you know, exploring, you know, uh, the universe. Um, and and there's, there's, there's good arguments on both sides for that. But what if we could just bypass the government, you know, and on a volunteer, volunteer basis, fund the projects we think are worth pursuing, you know, make, make the money, I guess, go to, let the public decide what they think is important. Um, on these kinds of online platforms, video games tend to be what's deemed the most important. On Kickstarter, uh, every year about $2 billion is raised through crowdfunding. Of that $2 billion, $250 million of it is toward video game development. So, the natural conclusion to that is to make science into video games that can then progress scientific research. And in fact, they've already done that. So there's this game, um, it's called Eterna, or E-T-E-R-N-A, and it's basically an RNA folding, folding game. You know, it, I don't think it's more difficult than Candy Crush. And it's, it's, it's about as fun, too. But what you're actually doing is you're solving puzzles that um, basically lead to... Well, I have to here. We're just going to go to the website. So I'm just going to read what it says here. You solve puzzles to design molecular medicines, right? And then when you solve them, you actually get feedback from the, the scientists that are, that are running the projects. This was started by a graduate student. Right? This wasn't started by a scientist who's been in the field for 40 years, you know. This was started by someone in college who thought, why not make science into a video game to do some of this work for us? 
and what they've actually done. Back in 2014, they had a paper with 37,000 co-authors listed. That's crazy. <laughs> if you look at, if you've ever done uh, research before, you see that sometimes they go a little crazy with the co-authors. You know, they it's not, sometimes it's almost like, all right, you let me use a beaker in the lab once, so I'm going to list you as a co-author to give you, you know, some some credit. And if you're the head of the lab, then you kind of just by default get on the paper, right? But typically, the three primary authors are the ones you look at. You know, the first two. On this paper that they published, right here, these first two pe people, Jeff Anderson Lee and Eli Fisker, if I click on their names, let's see if it'll come up. I guess it's not. They have no credentials. They're not attached to any university. They don't have a degree that's listed that's related to bioinformatics or RNA or anything. But their names are first on this research paper that was public, published in the Journal of Molecular Biology. That's pretty cool. Same with Eli Fisker. When you look at uh, Denis uh, Kozaradu, or however you say that, Michelle Wu, and a couple of these others, they're, they're the ones at Stanford and Cornell that helped you know, get this started. But they actually have a footnote that says, uh, Jeff Anderson Lee, Eli Fisker, and the other two, those four contributed equally to the, the paper. And in science, who gets the first primary authorship on a paper is a big deal, because that can make or break a career. If you are published in Nature or the you know or some, or some big journal, and your name is first, then you can get a sweet postdoc position at MIT or something because you have that prestigious publication, right? So it shows maturity and also I don't know just something very innovative to have these people that have no degree listed as primary authors on this paper. You know, that means I could go out, I could participate in this ETE RNA game, and if I work at it, I can get published, you know, without having to spend, you know, $100,000 in graduate school student loans. Right here, there it is, ET, ETE RNA players. So I downloaded, I downloaded the data set that listed all the players, and as of this year, so 2016, I saw over 200,000 people listed as co-authors on this paper. <laughs> well, two, it said 200, maybe it was less than that, but there's at least 200,000 people working on ET and RNA and thousands of people um, listed as co-authors on this paper. So much that the journal didn't really know what to do. They were just going to publish their usernames as co-authors, but that didn't seem professional. And so they contacted them, they're like, hey, are you guys cool with letting us put your real names on the paper? And they're like, eh, okay, fine. Because you know gamers are, you know, you, you hide behind it, that name sometimes. But uh, anyway, so that's, that's just incredible, in my opinion. Um, another, uh, so that's, that's a specific game. There's another one called SciStarter. And this one basically connects you with all of these uh, types of uh, games like ETE RNA. Um, they have stuff for cancer, like look at the top advertisement there. It's, an, it's a game on the App Store. Help us classify half a million tuber samples by March. You know, you're helping with cancer research. Um, you can pick an activity, pick a topic, all of these things. Um, and it's, uh, it's also a, a great benefit to scientists themselves. Because a lot of this data processing stuff that you can make into a fun game is typically done by like grad students that have, like they're doing the grunt work, they don't have the, uh, <laughs> they're not high enough on the totem pole to, to be running the op, right? So, back to, I guess, uh, citizen science, and there's the websites. Um, the cool thing about this was they didn't just play the game as it was. They sent feedback to these researchers at Stanford. They developed 80 of their own micro projects um, on their own to further explore certain concepts. And in case you're curious, what they discovered was that RNA is tougher to fold when it's asymmetrical, right? Which is something that, that had been kind of hinted at by scientists before, but the players developed an actual mechanism to measure how tough it is to fold RNA, which saves money because when you're in an actual lab and you're synthesizing these RNA samples, if they have something that physically can't fold into the right shape, they just wasted a 
you know, a bunch of money trying to synthesize that. So these people helped them out with that, and you know, they basically ran the show themselves. So the other cool thing that I found with crowdfunding is, sure, you can raise money for your cool, I don't know, mod of doom or whatever, but you can also save a life by, you don't have to read that whole text, it's kind of, you're not supposed to put that much text on a slide. <laughs> um, this girl's name is Ma, uh, Maya, and she, uh, she has a rare mutation, but she, she didn't talk until she was two, she had trouble walking and sleeping, like they didn't know what was wrong, and they did all these tests and they still didn't find anything wrong, and so they decided they needed a genetic test. And even though it's getting cheaper every year, these things cost upwards of five thousand dollars. You know, um, it's actually pretty incredible that these tests cost less than ten grand now. But um, anyway, the insurance company's like, no, we're not paying for that. This is a test that's super new. You know, we don't know what's wrong with your kid. Get lost. And um, I don't know if they actually said that. That's that's a little facetious on my part, but. Um, what happened was they, they went to a place called the Rare Genomics Institute and there they um, decided to do a sequence test on her exome, which is basically 80% of her chromosome that's in charge for pretty much everything in her body, just to find out what's wrong. If there was something wrong, it was most likely there. And so they did, um, they put a profile up on their, on their crowdfunding page, not the parents, of uh, Rare Genomics Institute, and they uh, they needed twenty five hundred dollars, which is uh, um, the rate that they agreed with uh, RGI to, to pay. In six hours, they had the money they needed because of the generosity of strangers. And once they actually sequenced her exome, they found I think it was a point mutation. That means one single nucleotide was different. In her, you know, in that, in billions of nucleotides, right? She's the only girl that has that mutation in the world that they know of. But they wouldn't have known that if they couldn't have afforded the genetic test. Unfortunately, they don't know a treatment for it yet. But it cuts a disease down to size when you can name it, right? If you don't know you have leukemia, but you know that, um, you know, you're you're lethargic, you, you know, you, you have headaches, you have all this, you know, all these problems. It helps to know what you have because then you can move forward in, in ways that uh, seemed impossible before. Um, there are tons of kids on this website that have been helped by crowdfunding. So I think on a case-by-case -case basis, um, you, we, can, we can help people that have uh, uh, rare diseases. Um, and the argument might be, well, we should focus on like malaria. That kills millions of people every year. Yeah, but if you look at how many people uh, have rare genetic disorders, it's actually a significant amount, and they kind of get forgotten because a lot, oftentimes there's no treatment for it. Um, so this crowdfunding model can, can help uh, people in unique situations that don't have, um, we're going to skip some things here, that don't have uh, the capability to pay for it themselves. So. Um, Transitioning once more into something that's a little bit more relevant to um, your life as a college student or as an adult learner um, is the problem of open access. So here's what happens. I'm going to lay it out for you. The, uh, you pay your taxes every year. Some of that money goes towards government grants. Those government grants are given to you know the NIH goes to scientists who do cancer research. That's published in the journal Nature. And then you can't read that publication because it costs $39 to read. And yet you paid for, um, you know, helped pay for some of the grant. That's circular logic, um, kind of incoherent in some places. But the point is, why is it the scientists that the government slash people of the United States are paying for available to those same people? In fact, sometimes it's not even available to the scientists that wrote the papers. They're charged to buy the article in the journal that, was, that accepted their publication, um, which is ridiculous. <laughs> in fact, it's gotten, uh, it's gotten pretty desperate in, in, in some cases. If you want to publish something in the Journal of Organometallic uh, Chemistry, um, 
you can publish, and then if you want to read it, it'll cost you 59 bucks to read. <laughs> or if you subscribe to three of those kinds of journals for a year, that's like half a Corolla. You know, and that's only three out of hundreds of research journals. You know, so what well, one? Uh, there's this girl from Kazakhstan who decided that this was this was uh, bogus, and she uh, took perhaps the wrong approach because she was angry. But what scientists and professors do when they don't have access to the the PDFs or the the research they need to do their research, they ask their colleague. Hey, do you have that PDF for that, you know, that paper? And they're like, sure, I'll give it to you. I paid for it, you can have it. You know, which is kind of, you know, it might be unethical, but um, subscription costs of journals are rising every year. You can ask any of the librarians. They're having to cut which journals um, they subscribe to because subscription costs are going up, budgets are going down, which means that if you want to do research, all of a sudden your ability to look at the cutting edge stuff is now, you know, you can't do it. So this girl from Kazakhstan, she, uh, she basically made Pirate Bay, and you know what that is, four research papers. 48 million research papers uploaded illegally onto the internet for anyone to download. She got an injunction from the United States, but she's in Russia and they can't do anything. And, and, so, and so it's still up. She changed the domain when it got taken down. It's still up there. I'm not going to encourage you to go on there because that's asking for trouble, just like downloading movies illegally is asking for trouble. <laughs> it's, it's not Sci-Hub, the one that you just saw. That's not, that's not, that's not, um, Anyway, um, I'm about out of time, but the, the point with her is she couldn't finish her doctoral thesis because she, I mean, some universities are richer than others, right? If you're really poor, maybe you can afford nature and like one for each school, like one for chemistry, one for, like that doesn't cover it, right? So, so she did this. Um, and the way forward is to, to make all science open. Um, to make it, to make it uh, more uh, accessible to the general public, to the people that are actually paying for it, you know. So, um, sometimes scientists have to post on, on Twitter, I can't has PDF <laughs> to find the, uh, the, the paper they need. Um, in conclusion, just skip to the end. Uh, there's plenty of brilliance out there. Why do you think people work in teams? because of the power and diversity. Uh, the natural world couldn't function at all without biodiversity, and the intellectual world is the same way. We can reach new heights in science, health, and business, and technology by utilizing the creativity of the masses. That's you guys. That's you guys participating in these scientific endeavors. Um, I believe people will rise to the occasion. If, um, collab collaboration in this regard is crucial. The dividends of education and communication skills of those involved, um, it will form uh, new links and bridges to a world of which we cannot yet conceive. We live in a time of grand opportunity, so seize it and go to sub discover something. Become a citizen scientist. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes, so you can ask any questions that you have. You're also welcome to fill out your surveys. Uh, bring those to me and then I'll give you a ticket. And we also have snacks in the back that you're more than welcome to participate in. Do we have any questions? So you mentioned the, the kids that are interested in, in you know, doing research in the mountain of volcanoes um, down in Ecuador. Do you think that, that there's any programs or any uh, crowdsourcing that we can do for kids, for local kids around here that might get them interested in, you know, developing that, that, I don't know how you say it, but just let it go out and just learn about science and something that's local to Valley here. Um, I'm not sure about the Valley here. You know, this is, this is a relatively new thing, and it's, it's growing every year. Um, I bet there's, there's probably plenty of stuff with ecology, um, as far as uh, some, some of the more hard sciences. I don't think there is yet for Utah, and that's where that's why it comes kind of down to to, to us to, to make these things happen. So uh, I guess uh, I think there's there's projects on like SciStarter that are specifically aimed for classrooms. 
So you can bring some of these things into the classroom, um, these games and stuff. So. Cool. Experience, how much of a science background do you have to have to play these games? None. Really? Yeah. And, and yet you're still somehow able to do research or figure things out that's actually benefiting research? Yeah. And so with, ET, with ETRNA, you just start off with simple puzzles, puzzles that don't even exist in nature because they're so simple. And you move on to more challenging ones until you get to a point where you're solving stuff that hasn't been solved before. And um, you can do that in a pretty, pretty fast time. You learn stuff along the way. With ETRNA, you don't even have to know why the molecules are binding. You just have to learn the game. You know, why does it, why does it work that way? And if you, if you learn the game, then maybe you'll learn the science along the way. And that's what they did. They got interested. Um, and why it was working this way, why some patterns work better than others. And, uh, you know, they mentioned this to the Stanford researchers, and they're like, well, crap, we didn't know that. Thank you, non-scientists. Hmm. Really um, have you used crowdsourcing or crowdfunding in the past, and do um, you plan on using it in the future for anything? Uh, Yes and yes. Not as much to crowdfunding because I don't have personal projects that need money, and I'm not going to hound you know myself on the internet for college funds like some people do. Um, but uh, there's some interesting things out there. Oh, I'm a lot. I need money. Uh, anyway, this I I have I'm registered on ETE RNA. I'm registered on Zooniverse, which has a bunch of things uh, from galaxies to to wildlife. There's a really fun one where you look at a. Uh, basically the Serengeti, and they have motion capture cameras, and any time an animal comes by, you know, the camera flashes, and, like, and then you have to look and you have to see, you know, what kind of animal it is, and, uh, you know, if it's a hyena or a rhino or whatever, and then you tell, you tell the scientists that. That was really fun for kids, and uh, I, I did that one. I was just doing, I did that one for like 40 minutes, <laughs> just looking at animals, and it was so much fun, and I could have taught a six-year-old how to do that, and I learned all sorts, there's like, Seriously, 60 trillion different kinds of antelopes in Africa, by the way. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I do participate in those things. Cool. So I'm guessing there's apps for all of these games? Oh, yeah. And then could I just, could I just like Google scientific discovery games? Or like, what would I Google to be able to pull up a list of them and find one that like is the most fun puzzle for me to do? Well, the one I saw that had some mobile apps, uh, SciStarter.com. Had, had one that had a direct link to the App Store. Um, Scientific American has that citizen science page. Um, some of these are a little bit hard to do in app format, um, but they, uh, they're working on all the time because more people use their phones than you know, their yeah, yeah, laptops. Yeah. You know? So I think that's an emerging market for this thing too. Market, I mean, vector, whatever, some of us were that describes that. All right, cool, thank you. Yeah, that's what I found. Sometimes it's like mind numbing some of the things that you're doing. You're like, okay, so maybe helping in some way, but I'm feeling like mindless. Yeah. You know, and you're or you're observing something. You know, and I know, you know, anything can get old, right? You know, sort of looking at documents, you know, but 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 like you acknowledge, there's opportunities for for finding that that niche thing, that interesting thing in Shakespeare or whatever it is. Um, so are you are you suggesting that these are the, the best that Zooniverse.org, SciStarter? Those are the, the ones. Those are the ones I've found that are pretty yeah. good. Um, but you're really right. One of the main limitations to this, because a lot of this is data processing, because that's what the scientists need. So they're constantly looking. Et RNA is probably the best one that's like an actual game. I haven't explored a lot outside of that. Um, there's also a game called Fold It, where you're folding proteins. Um, which is kind of a puzzle game, it's really hard. <laughs> so I didn't like that one. But uh, um, I think in the future, one of the things they should really look at is making these things not only beneficial to science, but just pure fun. Because right now, a lot of them are like, you look through the data, and it's like, okay, that's a regular galaxy, that's a spiral galaxy, that's whatever, that's a smudge, that's someone hit the telescope in space. You know, it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's, it can be mind-numbing. But, um, I had a great time with the animal one, you know, ETE RNA is really fun, and since there's more and more, scientists are finding this to be a really effective way to do it, they're just getting more creative. I'm asking a lot of questions. Um, I was 
also want to know, so like you mentioned that some people were able to be uh, on there as authors or as contributors to an article. Would that be considered in the educational and the scientific domain as publishing in a scientific journal? Yeah. So I can definitely. play games and receive publishings and I can put that on my resume. Yeah, for that's a little bit more involved. Like it's not just you play the game and then like you, you work on a project that like you, you, you're basically chatting with the other people in the game. You're like, all right, what's what? What have we noticed here? What? Uh, what's what's? You know, what, what are we looking for? What are we trying to solve? So there's it's kind of a, a collaborative thing. You know, they you know they didn't like they basically found the limitations that the designers of the game couldn't see, and then they said, look, here's where the problems are with this RNA folding thing, and look, we have this bit, this basic model for how it works. Can you, you know, refine it a little bit? So they work with the scientists, they then the gamers work with themselves and it is collaborative. Um, so it's, a, it's not as much you log on, you play 40 minutes, you get off. It's a little bit more consistent after than that, like anything. But if you saw the sheer number of people who were published, I think some of those people probably just solved one of the puzzles that was designed by the players that was was beneficial, and then they got listed. You know, so in that sense, you could say, yeah, I was a co-author on a scientific paper, and that one I think is easier than being a primary. If you're a primary author, that's hard. Being listed as a co-author, that's what you're good. Yeah, as long as you pick the right thing to play, like the project that's the most relevant to what they're trying to discover, mm -hmm. I think you, you can be. That's yeah. really cool. Grad school director. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was one puzzle that was only solved by one person. And I don't know if that was the primary author. It was just some user. And it was only solved by one guy that just, or girl, that just figured it out. You know, and so that's significant because they wouldn't have known if that was solvable or not if it wasn't that one person.